Okay, okay, so not everybody in the world is going to have a use for Docker. Your grandmother is probably not going to be spinning up a instance of Sonar. But if you have any interest in technology beyond the normal consumer uses of a desktop computer, for example, chances are there is a benefit that you can take from utilizing the Docker platform. Specifically, if you fall into one of three categories, let's say you are just a general novice, you are a home labber, you want to spin up some services to make either your data more localized and secure, or you want to give your friends and family something fun to play with. You could be a developer looking for a really easy way to ship and develop applications, or maybe you're a network administrator that wants to containerize some of the tools and platforms you happen to be using. Basically, in this video, I'm going to be showing you a wide range of use cases for Docker, including some that might surprise you. And if you didn't see it yet, we did a quick short tutorial on the absolute basics of Docker, knowing how to use it, what it is, and how to get started with it. So after this video, go ahead and check out that one. Now, something I'm really proud of is Docker actually reached out and partnered up after we uploaded that video to produce this one, both to demonstrate some features that they want you to be aware of, as well as for me to demonstrate how I use it and how you might want to use it. So first let's back up a little bit. Docker itself is a platform for developing, distributing, and running applications. It's based on the container format, which is a lightweight way of creating isolating computer environments. Containers are often compared to virtual machines, and while there is some overlap in use cases, they are fundamentally different technologies. Docker is super popular in both of this home lab scene as well as major companies, and that is for good reason. It greatly simplifies the process of actually deploying software because these containers are self-sufficient units, which in these containers it includes everything they need to run and it just tends to work. And this can save you a lot of headaches when it comes to the configuration and setup of the applications that you're trying to run. For developers on one hand, it provides a way to distribute applications with the benefits that I just mentioned, but Docker also streamlines the development and testing process along the way. When it comes to security, Docker is leading the way with Docker Scout, which is a service that helps developers to see and address vulnerabilities in the package that their code depends on. Getting started with Docker is quick and easy. Docker Desktop runs on all major operating systems. Or of course, if you're a fan of the terminal, you could go ahead and use Docker CLI tools. And in most instances, that can be installed with a simple script or just a couple commands. And with a few clicks, you could create a free account on Docker Hub and start publishing images just as a seamless process of your workflow. So with that, let's take a quick look at some examples of deployments and use cases, starting with developers. Again, Docker makes it incredibly easy to ship your app for users in a way to reliably install it with a consistent experience. And it can improve your workflows not just at the deployment stage, but at the very start of development. Docker has a comprehensive documentation with a ton of different resources, and this includes a variety of programming languages with specific guides to help you make the most out of your Docker development experience. For example, you could go to the Docker init guide to quickly and easily generate a Docker based environment based on the type of projects that you're working on. This right here is the specific Docker init documentation and they have full tutorials and a ton of different examples depending on what you're doing, whether that be Node, Python, Rust, so on and so forth. And this is a quick example of just running Docker in it. All you do is run the command to Docker in it. And then it will begin a walkthrough process of creating the files that you're gonna to need to create your Docker environment, including the Docker file, compose YAML, and your readme. For example, if you're a Python developer, if I go down here to example of selecting Python, all you do is type on the Python, the version of Python, you type in your listening port, and then you could go ahead and type a custom command. In this example, it's myapp.exampleapp. You bind the IP address, which for this case is just gonna be local, to that port, and then you select the Python directory. It creates everything for you, it tells you your files are ready, and then you're good to go. With Docker having generated everything, you can simply start building within that template, including the Docker file that will be used to build the container image. And if you want more information on where to go from there as a developer, you can check out these specific guides for the program languages that you're interested in, and this does include demo apps to give you some hands-on experience. Once you've built and uploaded your first image to Docker Hub, you can start taking advantage of Docker Scout to scan your image for any known software vulnerabilities. And since modern apps do tend to have a large tree of dependencies, it would be a big job to manually go through and check everything. 
for all these various security vulnerabilities. Docker Scout solves this by inspecting images automatically and comparing the contents against a database of known vulnerabilities. And this interface is available within Docker Desktop as well as a web application. For example here, this is an instance of Docker Desktop that I currently have on my production computer here. Last thing we did was playing around with Jellyfin. Now let's say I want to check this container. All I have to do is go over here to Docker Scout, you can see it just analyzed it and we do have some vulnerabilities. We have some medium and low severity vulnerabilities. So I can click here to view these specific packages that it's pointing out. And we can see here the total packages, the total images and the vulnerabilities that it found. And then we can just kind of scroll through here and see what exactly is going on. For example, this one right here, if I click show package details, this is the MIT Kerbos runtime libraries. And if I scroll down from here, it shows me the locations and all that. From here, if I click this little drop down, we can see some even more specific information. So we can see that this right here contains a memory leak vulnerability. And then depending on the severity and the actual issue, as a developer, you can make the decisions on what to actually do with it. And there is an option here for fixable packages. And if I drop this down, open it up, I get some information on that as well. So from there, we're gonna talk about network administrators. Now this could be whether if you're like an IT professional for a business or if you're just trying to make your home network as secure and feature rich as possible. Docker's networking features are somewhat behind the scenes, but it in fact provides a advanced system for managing your network communication, both within the applications themselves and providing access for users. By default, Docker containers are isolated from public access via the host network. This means it has fairly good security from the start, and for deployments with multiple services and containers, such as maybe a web server and a database, Docker provides secure networking communications between these services. Multiple different deployments can also be isolated from each other. When using Docker Compose, for example, each deployment gets its own separate network. And private networking between these containers is secure and also convenient because Docker provides a built-in DNS system that allows containerized services to reference each other by name instead of IP address. And when public access is needed, it can be specifically defined by publishing certain ports on the host network. Overall, it's just a simple, secure approach, which removes a lot of hassle, configuration, nightmares, and headaches for these administrators. And Docker Scout can also be used to check for these network vulnerabilities in addition to the various packages that are built into a container. While home enthusiasts probably don't have the exact same concerns and requirements as large enterprises in this regard, it's always good to be aware of any potential security threats. If you're gonna be managing any services that are open to the public or even your friends and family, then of course, staying on top of the security is very important. And finally, Docker can actually deploy a lot of various tools and services that network administrators can use directly, which I'll actually show you two of the main ones that I'm using right now. For example, on my local network, I have actually associated the domain hopkey.net. So this domain is only accessible here. And with that, I started up Nginx Proxy Manager and I can use this to actually associate or assign this domain name with subdomains to various ports on my home network. So for example, if I click on audiobook.hopkey.net right here, you can see it loads up audiobook shelf. And overall, this is just a really nice, clean way to organize all the services on your system without having to like memorize all these IP addresses. Another example of something that I have running on my entire network is this right here. This is AdGuard Home. This is acting as the DNS for my network. And what this does is block out DNS queries that are associated with advertisements. It's very customizable. You could see it's blocked almost 7,000 different queries. If we go over to settings here, you do have more things such as uh, DHCP settings, DNS settings, which here you could set what DNS servers you want to use. And of course there are other similar services such as Pi-hole, which do the same thing has a lot of the similar features, but some unique differences here and there. And then from there, we could kind of transition into home lab geeks and everybody else. This is the category I fall into. I unfortunately am not a builder, more of a consumer. If we head over to my Unraid instance here and go to Docker, on this one machine you can see everything I currently have set up. A lot of the R applications, we have Twingate running, a few download clients, and some media streaming clients, at least on this machine. This is the kind of media box that I have running. And at least on the user side, it is incredibly easy to set up. And the beautiful thing about Docker is it's so widely used that a majority of these platforms that you're gonna put on a server to help you manage it is going to have some sort of Docker integration to make it everything just a little bit easier. 
In this example for Unraid, if I go over to apps, which are just Docker containers other than their plugins, and I go down to pick something, these right here are their spotlighted applications. And if I wanted to fire up something such as Wiki.js, all I would do is click install. And this is just basically kind of a formatted Docker run command that they kind of walk you through. We have the name, the actual repository, which this is the username of the developer and then their actual application. And then we have our port, our database information, and just all the options that we would customize in a normal kind of Docker run command. And even if you have something just like a Ubuntu server, most of these applications, whether that be on Docker Hub or another platform, are gonna have simple commands that you could copy, paste, run, and launch these applications incredibly easily with some minor configuration needed here and there. One of my personal favorite things about it is the actual volume management, whether you want to make an actual Docker volume, which then you can link up in your run command or Docker compose file, or if you want to bind the volume as a directory on your host system, it's really easy to do all that. And of course I go into that a whole heck of a lot more in that kind of Docker intro guide that we have on the channel. And I do recommend you check it out because it really just shows how easy Docker is to actually use. Once you kind of understand the volumes, some of the networking and ports, as well as how to configure things and just understand the variables within these Docker run commands or compose files. Every single machine that I have running as a server on my home network is utilizing Docker in one way or another. Even Proxmox here, which is a virtualization platform, which has their own containers that you can spin up. Within even their containers, I'm running Docker containers. Containers within containers, it's truly beautiful. So just overall, it is an incredibly powerful tool. The containers are really easy to update. I go over that in the video as well. If I wasn't utilizing Docker in my home network, my setup would be incredibly more complicated than it is now. And personally, that is why I use Docker and I recommend you do too, try it out. Even if you aren't that interested in tech, there's a Docker container that is awesome for something that you are trying to do. Again, big thank you to Docker themselves for actually working with me on this video. Not to downgrade any other sponsors, but this is definitely one of them that I am the most proud of. So big thank you to you guys. And with that, like always, anything that I mentioned in this video is going to be linked down below. And with that, I do hope you have an absolutely beautiful day and goodbye.